kids in the backyard Playing astronauts and rock stars No one told us to stop it Called us unrealistic Then suddenly you're 18 Go to college for your plan B What you want is too risky Live for weekends and whiskey We all got these big ideas One day they're replaced with fear How did we get here? Darling, don't quit your daydream It's your life that you're making It ain't big enough if it doesn't I recover loud. <laughs> Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life in recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover loud yeah Hi, and welcome to this Father's Day special of Recover Loud. Tonight's guest is a friend of mine, Ryan Page, and I'd like to welcome Ryan back to the show. Uh, Ryan, welcome. I appreciate seeing you every time you're, you're able to come. Thank you, Mike. Great to be here. Yes, and uh, happy Father's Day. Thank you. Same to you. Um, so, Ryan, you're a father of how many? Three. Three kids. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, like myself, uh, I, I understand that while you were raising your children, uh, you were in, in your period of active use. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, so my oldest daughter is 23 now. So she was born when I was 17. So she got the whole spectrum of, of my use. I didn't stop using until 37. So um, she really got the whole spectrum of what my life looked like. Um, so I have three children with three different mothers. And um, and I wasn't, I wasn't really present for any of them. Okay. But, but like I was, I was with each of their mothers for a period of time. And I had I had done some dad things, right? Like I got him dressed and I gave him baths and, and I worked and, um, you know, I, I played the role of dad, but I was never really a father. Um, now were, were you using at 17 when you first became yes. a father? Yeah. So at set by 17, I was in my dark prime, right? Like okay. I, I was just getting into, um, a variety of different substances. It got worse. Obviously, we know it progresses over time. So it was the beginning of this uh, long journey of, of active addiction. But uh, so it was at that time, it was more criminal behavior and weed, alcohol, pills. Um, and just being, okay. <laughs> being, a, being a degenerate in, in yeah. general. Oh, yeah. So, so chaotic. Yes. Um, so as, as you mentioned, you said three, three kids, three different mothers. Yeah. Um, you know, without, you know, getting into the, the details of your relationship. Um, so after you left the mom of your first child, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, relationship did you, did you maintain with your, with your child? Um, not a very good one. So I was a kid. I was a kid that had a kid. So I, mm -hmm. and me and her mother weren't necessarily really together. Um, we were on and off, on and off for a, a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so when we were off, I wasn't there, right? Like I wasn't there to be a dad. 
not that I knew what being a dad even looked like at that time in my life. Yeah. Um, so so did, did you have a father growing up? Was your father around? No, my father also suffered with, with, uh, with opiate addiction. So he wasn't around and, you know, going through that, I always told myself that when I did have kids, I wouldn't be that way. Yeah. Um, that that wouldn't happen to me. I would be a better father. And I think that I always aspired to be, I think I always wanted to be better than, than what I had. And, um, you know, the, the sad thing is I had nothing. So anything was better than that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so I wasn't, I wasn't really around a lot in her early years. And then, um, I got arrested. I went to prison when she was around five or six and I did yeah. four years in prison then. So, um, so I wasn't around for that either. And so it was just a constant in and out, in and out of her life from the beginning. Yeah. So do you have, um, an understanding? Do you, do you believe that she really knew who her dad was? I don't think so. I, I think that, that early on, um, you know, she's, I think all my kids have always, everybody want, every kid wants a father, right? So yeah. I think that, that early on, like, she's always been like a daddy's girl. She was always loving and, and was happy when I was around. And I don't think that she understood, uh, like, I don't think any kid understands that young of an age exactly what's happening. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, as, as you're talking, um, uh, you're, you're talking about Tiana, your oldest. Right? Yes, my oldest. Yeah. And you said, how old is she today? 23? 23. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my experience is a little bit different. Um, I was using while I was raising my, my kids, but I was pretending to be that father, um, mm -hmm. taking them to little league games. Uh, you know, when I was hustling and, and selling pills, I used that money to take them on vacations, you know, whale watching, right. camping trips. Um, you know, and I thought, you know, I was hiding it from the world and I thought that I was hiding it from my kids as they got older. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, Tiana or, or any of the other kids know that you were using substances? Was it obvious or apparent to them or, or do you think you, you, so I think that as, as time progressed, um, my, my addiction progressed. And it became more and more unmanageable for me. Mm -hmm. um, like with Tiana, I was in and out of her life, in and out of her life. Um, and then there, there came a period in time where I, I did well after I got out of prison. And then I had my son with my second child's mother. And I did well for a little bit. You know, I just mm -hmm. got out of prison. I, you know, I, I felt like I was on the right path. Um, I had actually gotten custody of, of Tiana. And she lived with me and my girlfriend at that time. And then we had my son, Noah. And um, and things were going well. I, I got off federal probation. And the day I got off, I started getting high again. Uh, within two very short months, everything that I had built up with having Tiana there and having a, a safe, structured home for her kind of went away. And uh, we went to staying in a townhouse in Saco. Um, I unraveled quickly. And so I think that at that time is the first time that Tiana really got to witness my act of drug addiction. Um, so she got to go through the opioid withdrawals and the mm. near overdoses. And, and how, how old would you say she was then? She was in middle school then. So 13. Yeah. yeah um, and, and by then kids, kids really know what's going on. Right. Um, they've got an understanding of drugs um, or substances. And, and they, at that age, they probably know someone or have been around other people outside the family that right. might be, you know, uh, maybe it was alcohol or weed. Um, yeah. So, you know, they, they've got that. And then to, to, to find out that that's what's happening at home, you yeah. know, um, it, it is, is something. I know when my kids found out, um, it was much later. Um, you know, towards the end, when, before I left for rehab, uh, that they really found out the extent of my use. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I, I know my son Dylan said, I thought you were just smoking weed. Right. Um, you know, he had no idea that we were doing the highest of the highs and the lowest right. of the lows, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it was quite the shock, you know. Right. Um, so, um, 
you know, how do you believe that that, you know, a- affected her life? You know, was she a caring daughter? Was she upset? Was she, did you fight? What was that like? Um, no, we didn't really fight. As I, as I said, man, I was, I was in and out very often. So, um, the relationship was obviously strained, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, she had a a tough time and we went from, you know, her living with her mom to living with me and my girlfriend and then to me, you know, to that ending and then going to another place. And then I unraveled and, um, and put her with my aunt because I couldn't take care of her or not that I couldn't, but I chose to continue right. active use over, over being a father. And, um, you know, I told myself like it was the best thing for her, um, because I wasn't capable of taking care of a kid. When in reality was, I, I, I just didn't want to stop getting high. Yeah. And, you know, I actually, I, I left my second son in Massachusetts with my aunt and uncle, um, you know, because that allowed him to play football and basketball. Um, It allowed him to live on the lake, you know, have a car and and use the jet ski and the party boat, you know, and it gave him a lifestyle that I knew I couldn't give him. But in the back of my head, it was also getting him away from the substance use that I knew I was dealing with. Right. And I I figured that was going to give him a chance to get away from Yeah, the same. And, and, you know, at the time when I when I made this decision, you know, I, I thought that I was me being a good dad. It was me making the right decision for her. In hindsight, now looking back at it, it was really just a selfish move. Yeah. Like, yes, she did have a better life than I could uh, could have given her. But that was only due to the fact that I, I chose to actively engage in, in using substances. And I was so deep in my addiction that that was what I wanted to do. So mm. Um, not only did it, you know, it was like a win-win, right? Like my kid gets afforded a better life and I get afforded to keep getting high. Right. So, right. You know, so that's right. No, no responsibility. No responsibility, right? No responsibility, yeah. no accountability. Um, I just didn't want to go the fuck up, man. Like I just yeah. I wanted to keep doing what I was doing and date yeah. girls and get high and, and live that lifestyle. And, and, um, and I didn't realize how valuable being a parent was. I didn't realize how much yeah. of a gift that actually was. Mm. To me, it was just a fucking responsibility and something right. I had to deal with. It wasn't something that I got to do, right? And it wasn't yeah. until all of my kids weren't in my life anymore that I realized how much of a privilege being yeah. a father is, right? Like, it wasn't like, yeah. this is gimme and I'm a dad, so that's what it is. It, it, I didn't realize that it took stepping up and taking accountability and responsibility and sacrificing um, to be a dad. like. Like, you know, yeah. uh, my dad was a dad, right? My dad had sex with my mom. I was born, but he was never present. So he was never actually a father. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where I was headed. Like, I, yeah. you know, I, would, I got pictures of the kids and like a lot of lip service shit. Like, yeah. you know, I would show up well, and, days and. Yeah. And, and that's what that's, that was the example you were shown. Right. You know, yeah. Um, you know, and, and, you know, one thing that, you know, talking with a lot of people, um, you know, they're ashamed of how they, they raise their kids, um, you know, or, it, or it's it's hard to forgive themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, how do they find forgiveness for neglecting their child? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, you know, for me, I can't deny the neglect and the abuse. Um, you know, I was present for my mm-hmm. kids, but I was high. You mm-hmm. know, um, if they had a little league game, they were going, but we weren't leaving until I got high. Right. Um, and if I had to wait for my guy, they may be late, you yeah. know, and there was, there was no, no way around it. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, I might've been there, but I know that, you know, they went days without food sometimes because I didn't right. have that. Um, you know, we didn't always have toilet paper in the house. We had people in and out of the house, right. you know, that at that time, you know, it wasn't a safe environment, right. you know, and I can't deny that. Um, but you know, getting to a point where, you know, I can accept what I did. Uh, I can't change it. But from this day forward, I can be the present parent that I that I always wanted to be, you know. Um, so uh, obviously you found recovery um, several years ago. Um, and how, how long did that take you to 
to get into recovery and then start building a, a good relationship with your, your children. Okay, so um, my recovery journey kind of started with my oldest daughter. Um, okay. You know, back to a point where um, she just didn't want to have anything to do with me. And she mm -hmm. told me, like, if you can't stay sober, I don't, I don't want to deal with you anymore. Um, I can't have you in and out of my life and out of my life. And so she set that boundary up and, um, and she said like six months, like if you can stay sober six months and we'll talk. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, you know, somewhere along the catalyst of, of where things were going. Everybody, I was at the end of it. Like all my family had, had pretty much, you know, shut me out. My, I couldn't see my son. I hadn't seen my son already in years as it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I was active with, with my daughter and my oldest daughter said she didn't want to talk to me. And she had the, the wherewithal to say, like, this is not good for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it started there. And then I think that after entering into sober living and starting to work on myself, it took about three months before we actually started to talk. Yeah. And um, so, so Ryan, uh, sorry to interrupt. I think it's a, yeah. a great time, um, you know, to Tiana's here. Uh, yep. She's going to be joining the show. I think yep. this would be a great time to bring her in um, and, uh, you know, get, get some of her, her perspective as well. Perfect. Let me bring her in. Sure. Thank you. So uh, welcome, Tiana uh to recover Hi. loud uh so i was just i was just talking with your dad uh and he was telling us about um you know what it was like for him uh raising you while he was in active use right. and the um you know the boundary that you set um you know for him to finally get sober um and and to do the right thing um you know and and he said that that was the catalyst for getting him to where he is today um right. so do you remember having that conversation with him years ago faintly um i think we're if it's the same one where i said about the six months yeah yeah so basically um i think it was something to do with christmas i got him something for christmas it's funny i still have the thing that i got him for christmas um he had told me that he couldn't see me on christmas because he couldn't he couldn't afford a gift um, mm -hmm. He forgot his gift. He couldn't get a gift. He kept talking about a gift. And I was like, I don't care. I got you something. Mm -hmm. And he just kept talking about that. And then I kind of figured um, he was using and told him, like, listen, if you don't get sober um, and, like, I want you to have, like, six months underneath your belt before, like, I communicate with you. And that was that was basically that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um so uh if you don't mind tiana i we've gotten you know your dad's perspective and and on on what it was like to raise you um do you mind t talking with me one-on-one -on -one, uh, for a minute and we'll, yeah. we'll get your perspective of that time all right yep He did tell me that you guys have had conversations, um, you know, about his his use, his his recovery. You've been present for events. Yep. Um, you know, my daughter and I, uh, well, me and my sons as well, we've been able to have those conversations right. um, that, you know, and recoveries provided me the opportunity and the ability to have those conversations. Right. Um, so um, first, let's let's start with. Um, you know, when you were a kid and, you know, he said he wasn't very present, um, you know, he, the relationship ended and he was gone um, from that relationship. Um, how old were you uh, when you're when 
your parents first split up. Uh, were you old enough to know and remember? No. no, no, he was. I didn't really know him until I was probably mm -hmm. about ten. Yeah, like I, I knew like that was my dad, but I didn't have a relationship with him. He was in prison, yeah. so I didn't really know him until I was ten, and then he got out and got custody on me, and I just had to go live with this man. <laughs> oh, so and that's kind of what happened. So that that was strange for you. Yeah. Um, was it scary? Yes and no, because he was a lot different from my mom. I, he made me do chores. He was a normal parent. He was like, oh, wow. you're doing chores and you're, you, I don't care if you scraped your leg. Oh, well, we're not going to the doctors. My mom would have yeah. baby me. <laughs> yeah. He didn't baby me. Yeah. So well, and, you know, as, as he was saying, you know, he didn't have that experience growing up himself. He didn't have a, have a dad. Yeah. Um, up till that point, he didn't have a child. Yeah, so exactly. all of a sudden now getting out of prison, He's got a 10 year old daughter, yeah. you know? Um, so, uh, you know, from my perspective, I can promise you he was probably just as scared, you know? Yeah. Um, I can only imagine. Yeah. And, you know, we don't, we don't receive a manual, you know, the day you guys are born on what we're supposed to do. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's trial and error. Um, so here you are 10 years old, moving in to live with this guy that you don't know who's just out of prison. Um, did you, had you been told anything about his past? Were you, did, did you think of him as a drug addict or a criminal? Criminal, um, not mm. drugs. I didn't yeah. think of him as a drug addict. Um, I didn't really know that much about that until later on, probably like mm. 14, maybe. Yeah. Um, but when I, when I first got out, like I used to visit him. There's um, probably pictures that my dad had given you there are mm -hmm. pictures of me as little me with him. And you can tell where he's in prison. Tell which ones. Gotcha. So I'll be brought to all these different places. Go visit him in prison. My mom would always, we go on a little vacation. We go to Disney <laughs> and we go visit my dad to all these different places. And it would always be, he's in school. That's what I was told oh. that he was in school. So we had to visit him at college. Wow. So, yeah. I so knew he was bad. Like, did anything? I still don't really know why. I still don't know why he went to jail. No idea. Really? Yes. Well, when we get back with him, we will ask him that. Yeah, <laughs> and, I would love and to. See, I still don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, that's something that you know, as I was saying, my recovery has given me the opportunity to have those conversations. It's also given my kids the opportunity to ask those questions. Right. Um, and of course. You know, when we're speaking and having these conversations, we don't know what to tell you because we don't know what you want to know. Right. Um, you know, so um, I did mention to him, uh, you know, last week when we were getting ready for this, um, you know, if you had questions that were still unanswered um, and if you were willing to ask, um, you know, if he'd be willing to answer those questions and just to put him on the spot, he did say yes. Oh. Um, so. Um, you know, but those are the things, you know, w w we don't know. Um, right. So you said you were about 14 um, when you found out about the drug use. Right. Um, so tell me about that. How did you first find out or realize that your dad was using drugs? Okay. So it's in me. It's give me a little um, like hard to talk, like not hard to talk about it, but hard to remember is I have PTSD. So I don't really remember no. a lot of things. Um but I'll try to remember as best as I can. No, and, and that's fine, honestly. And and it's it's not um, uncommon for you to have that PTSD and, and memory issue. My daughter is the same way. Mm. Uh, my daughter can remember instances of fighting, yep. arguments, um, missing out on stuff, um, being late, not being able allowed to go. Um, but she doesn't remember the good times. No. Um, no. You know, and, you know, I remember one time she said, uh, I keep having this memory or a dream of us being in the backfield with tall grass and we're flying kites. And she said, I have that dream all the time. And I said, well, that's a memory that we did actually do, Aww. you know? Um, and, and it was hard for her to, to connect yeah. that to reality because yeah. so much of her reality was negative. Right. Um, you know, and uh, as I was explaining to your dad, I was present 
for my kids the entire time. From the right. time my daughter was born to the time she was 16, I was using. Right. Um, I tried to hide it from them. We took them, uh, you know, when I was selling drugs, I was able to take them whale watching, camping trips, you know, uh, fun town, splash town. We did all those fun things, but it was drug money. So exactly. even if the good memories today, it's tainted with the knowledge and fact that it took drugs to, per to pay for it. And okay. every time we snuck off to the bathroom, it was to get high. Exactly. So, so you know, don't feel bad about the memory issues. Uh, I yeah. think it's very common. And, you know, children with, um, you know, parents who suffered, uh, you know, I'm sure that PTSD is very real. So, yeah. Um, I feel like it was probably when we were living on our, on our own. Yeah. Um, it's like a very, like, kind of distinctive we were living on our own and um there was nights where he wouldn't come home um and i would go to my next door neighbor and i would knock on her door i didn't even know this woman but i would go next door and i'd knock on the door and i would say i need to use your phone because i didn't have one um we would have no heat because he didn't pay for the oil um so we'd have no heat the power was ready to go i remember i had a hamster the hamster died because it was so cold um and I went next door and I would call him and try to get him to come home. This would happen like probably a couple times a week. And then one night he came home and um, I have had really bad anxiety during that time. I was taking melatonin to fall asleep. It was, I kind of knew something was up, I feel like, because I couldn't fall asleep. I was really afraid to be in that house by myself. I thought something was going on. Um, and... It's when he came home and he was like, he cried to me. I think, I think he talked about he wanted to die. Mm. He was crying to me. And I think I was, mm. I honestly couldn't tell, tell you my age. Yeah. But he cried to me. He was telling me that he wanted to die and he didn't know what was going on. And that he was sorry. But mm. that's what I remember. And I want to say eighth grade. So, yeah. what, 13? Mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like it was, there. yeah, around that time. Yeah. Um, that's, that's tough for, for a 13 year old to have their parent come to them. Um, mm -hmm. you know, especially, you know, if it's suicidal or, you know, ideation and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, how did that affect you? You know, well, um, <laughs> I mean, I got, I, I got mental health issues out the wazoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I don't I don't blame that on yeah. on him either. Mm -hmm. I mean, not mm -hmm. only his like my family from his side, but mm -hmm. my family and my mom's side also has addiction issues. So yeah. it's not the blame is not all right. on him for that. Good. But so I mean, he, he mentioned leaving you with his aunt um yes. at, at some point. Was that before um you went to live with his aunt? Yes, this was Right before, um, then another instance happened where I was in a hotel room. Um, he had gotten a different car. <laughs> um, we went to Sleepy Hollow in Bitterford. Mm -hmm. And um, we had gone to hotel rooms. And I don't, we had got kicked out of our apartment or left the apartment. Something happened. We weren't living there. And we went to this hotel room. And my dad left me in that hotel room for about two days, I think. Um and no one knew where I was. And uh, my aunt ended up having to come get me because the, like, the front, um, the office knocked on our door because my dad didn't pay anything. <laughs> and I was just chilling in there like, hey, wow. what's up? And um, so my aunt had to come get me. And it was ended up being, I don't know if my dad was high or if he was drunk, but he got, um, he had crashed his car head on into oh. a tree. So, and then he was arrested. And um, mm -hmm. at that time, he, I think prior to this, he wrote out a thing saying that he gave his full- um, Parental rights. The, yes, mm -hmm. to Robin Forbes, which she probably saved my life. Actually, not probably, she did save my life. Mm -hmm. That would have been in foster care or even probably right. something worse if it wasn't for her. Right. So once you went to live with his, with with her, um, mm -hmm. and you know he did mention that you know 
during that time he continued using. Mm-hmm. Um, saw that as an opportunity to use because he now didn't have the responsibility to raise you. Right. Um, was he present uh, any more than he had been earlier? Um, not, not really. I mean, prior to that, I was living with him. So other than that, he would, yeah. he would stop in um, yeah. every now and then. But that was really it. We had talked about the the six month challenge i'll mm-hmm. call it that you gave to him right and how he described that as the catalyst um to get to where he is today um was it easy for you to turn around and be support for him once he did what you had asked here's the thing it was probably two months in and i threw the towel oh, i was ready i was like yeah okay you want to come when I can hang out at Thanksgiving, <laughs> that was, he was at a sober living. Um, mm. I think it was, I think it was either two or three months sober. Um, and I had just reached out to him and I was going through a time where I'm very much a life is short person. I don't like holding grudges. Um, it's very mm. life short. We all, we know mm. that, especially when it comes to an addict. Yeah. So it's, it's a scary thing. And I didn't want to, hold that anymore so i was like listen two months that's a that's a lot it's a lot it is for some people so i invited him to thanksgiving with my mom's side (laughs) so might have been a little awkward for him (laughs) but yeah he he went yeah and and that's great um you know it i had a son who i left to live with my aunt Mm -hmm. um for some some of the same reasons I saw it as, you know, bettering him, giving him better opportunities, stuff that I couldn't provide him, but it gave me opportunity to do what I could had wanted to do without the responsibility. Um, and today my recovery has been working and building to, to get that, you know, those, you know, my, my kids back supporting me, uh, loving me. So, um, you know, I'm sure, um, that was a great, great feeling and time for him. Right. Um, you know, to get that, to reach that goal right. without having to wait six months. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that's great, um, that you were able to do that. Yeah. And, you know, because I, I, I guess from, from what I understand or, or believe from, from what you said is, you know, you had had that relationship with him for a short time when he was first out of prison, he wasn't using drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you had that time with him, um, and then, you know, you loved him enough and, you know, to give him that chance. And then you were starving for that connection back. And when you saw that he was doing the work that he needed to do, um, you know, you, you reached out and, and brought him back. So, um, you know, I, I do believe, um, you know, that, you know, that you were the catalyst, you know, or, or part of the catalyst that got him to where he is. Yeah. And, you know, the things that he does today is because he did it for his family you yeah, know, to be the dad that he always wanted to be. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, the member of the recovery community that he is today is thanks to the work that you did with him. So, you know, we're grateful for that, that effect that you had on him, <laughs> you know, um, I'm because, <laughs> yeah. And because he's turning around and he's helping lots of others. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, building that, that community around him and uh, for others is really special. Right. Um, so let's let's bring your dad out and uh, you know have a quick chat with the three of us before we yeah. go. Okay. One second. No. <laughs> what did you go to prison for? I still don't know that. <laughs> no. Man, uh, I went to prison for obviously for drugs. Well, that's what I figured. Well, figure now, like as of recently, not as recently, but when I found out you did drugs, but yeah, prior, I had no idea. I never knew the exact reason or why you traveled to so many states. Because that's how the feds do their prison thing. But um, yeah, I sold, I sold crack cocaine to an other undercover DEA agent, oh, and then good. they sent me all over the country mm. and finished <laughs> off in. New Jersey, where you came down and visit me, um, with your grandmother, grandfather, your mom, <laughs> and um, whole, family. whole family. Yeah, 
Uh, they they disguised it as a Six Flags trip. And huh. I told you so it was not, always a Disney trip. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what they told you about where I was, but um, you know, when you when you came in, we were all in khaki suits, so it could have looked like we were at like a a school of some sort. School. Yeah. Mm. I was in college. Exactly. Four years of college. Yeah, and and that's that's what she said she was told. Yeah. Um, that she was visiting you in school. Um, yeah. no and degree. you know. <laughs> Didn't you know no um you know and you know i i do want to thank you guys um you know for being candid for being open um you know for sharing what it was like for you um in your mm -hmm. experience um you know uh, the very first season i was able to talk to my daughter um and get you know some some insight into how she felt um you know and i gave her the opportunity to ask me questions um mm -hmm. things that she didn't know um you know years later you know, I, I'm sure there's still plenty of things that we haven't discussed, mm. um, but recovery provides us, you know, the, the willingness, the openness and the ability to talk about the things that, you know, we, we used to keep hidden and we're ashamed yeah. of um, and things that we thought would still hurt us. You know, we can't talk about that, um, you know, so recovery provides that, um, you know, this show um, is, is about that connection. Um, and showing how recovery can open us up um, to these conversations to build the relationships back that we may not have had or that we destroyed um, years ago by our use. Um, so thank you, Tiana. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Ryan, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk some more, uh, get some work done together. Um, Tiana, good luck to you. Um, thank you. Good luck you to know. you as well. And congratulations thank you. and happy Father's Day. <laughs> Yes, I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, just just keep working and, and stay open and, uh, you know, do the things you guys have been doing. And, and thank you for supporting your dad. As I said, um, you providing that catalyst for change for your, your dad has helped build support and provide catalysts for others to find the help that they need. Um, Ryan, uh, real quick, how is um, Access Direct Recovery Network going? Access Direct Recovery Network is going very well. Um, mm. we continue to grow network and, um, we continue to structure, um, for the long haul here, obviously, you know, during the summertime, a couple of different things happen. Um, a, the, the, the amount of phone calls that come in go down, mm. um, summertime equals nicer weather, more access to money, substances, things of that nature. Well, people um, are, people aren't so, um, afraid to live outside yeah homeless and, you know, and, and to live that lifestyle right and it's you know there's more money there's more work um mm -hmm. we get into the winter season and and people start to get cold and lonely and holidays and families and and um mm. the emotions start to kind of sink in and um i think that's the time where we're most busy also we have the for-profit business um mm -hmm. during the summer which takes up a a whole bunch of our time um however we're still able to help on that end uh 95 percent of the of the 30 plus employees that we have at ceo camp pro are all in recovery uh from different sober houses and recovery centers so um we try to make sure that we're helping at all times it's kind of the cornerstone of of what me cynthia and, and our family is about um if you ever see access direct anywhere doing anything it's usually us as a family that's great so that's great well thank you again um you know thank you ryan for the work you're doing thank you tiana for being there to support for him um you know and thank you both for coming on the show uh to recover loud thank you for having us thank mike you. it's always a pleasure happy father's day ryan happy father's day brother take thank care you. <laughs> Namaste. i recover there <laughs> let's go I'm on a journey to discover the truth Living life and recovery is lovely You got the power in you Surround yourself with positive energy Judges hitting people with provocative penalties Need to make a change Advocate to change the laws Prove the people that it's not insane When you stand behind a cause I'm here to speak about the pain Recover loud to normalize the disease That's been killing all my friends And my family The time is now to let it all go and Recover loud The benefit is healthy people Family and friends that never have to overdose.